Welcome to this week's edition of Rider Support. Today we're going to talk about road helmets with visors. Are they hot or are they not? The coldest day ever on the bike. Was it at a pro race a couple of weeks ago or have I had a worse experience? I've signed up to track at 360. It's 360 kilometers of gravel. I know, what the hell was I thinking? But first, we're going to talk about how you can descend really, really, really fast, but safely. Sarah, how are you? I'm good. It's good to be back. This is a really interesting question. I'm going to be listening very closely to what you say about this. So here we go. Anthony and Sarah, thanks for the great content. I tune in every week. I have a question around descending. I was on a trip to the Alps with a group last summer and even though I was first to the top because I'm light and fit, I was getting passed by everyone, even the 65-year-olds on the descents, even though I feel like I'm actually going fast and really pushing my limits. We're heading over to Girona for another trip in a few weeks and I would love some advice on how to improve my downhill speeds. What's his problem with 65-year-olds going fast downhill? <laughs> They're obviously just more, more experienced than you. This is something that I definitely need to listen into. I think I was a good descender when I first started cycling because I didn't really understand, you know, if it went wrong, it could go super wrong. I was a little bit green. Now yeah, I'm a, bit, a lot more cautious. Yeah, we, we went to Colombia on a bikepacking trip and Colombia is a dangerous, like it's a beautiful place to ride a bike. I'd love to go back there a little yeah. bit fitter and explore maybe without you. So I <laughs> didn't have to go like 15k an hour. Off you go. Uh, but I would love to go back and explore it. But it's dangerous because there's a lot of potholes on the descents and you need to be able to take, what did the cops call it, a of action to get around that pretty fast, either a bunny hop or a swerve. Yeah. But you were like Moharich on the yeah. descent. Like, you know, interpretation or appreciation of risk. Well, I think it was just because, again, like I learned how to ride following your wheel and I was just essentially doing everything that you were doing. I was braking when you were braking. I was leaning when you were. And then look, as I've gotten more experience and just kind of that fear and the, those kind of little doubt moments going, oh, Jesus, have crept in as I've gotten older and wiser. Now I'm kind of feathering the brakes more. Now I'm going slower. You start watching getting... pro cycle and seeing the crashes. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, this is real. Yeah, this could be life changing if I get this wrong. And I can. Yeah, I agree. So I think, yeah, any tips for Matt here? He's heading off to Girona and he wants a couple of kind of pointers as to what to do to improve his downhill speeds. Well, I think like the main thing is don't push beyond your comfort because right. if you're already talking about like you feel like you're already on your limit like maybe pull that back you shouldn't feel like you're on your limit I never feel like I'm on my limit unless recently in Ross Moon I was definitely on my limit I forget dropped on a climb and I'm like coming back at 100k an hour you were on taking chances and, yeah there's no need to do that when you're out on a and especially when you're practicing yeah exactly when you're on holiday I and mean, when you're out in the middle of the mountains why would you risk that so but Let's talk about the what you can put into practice a little bit. Like we're not saying you should go on your limit, but you can practice th this stuff at slower speed. I think positioning yourself on the bike means an awful lot. So if you're going through a left-hand corner, you want to have the left-hand crank up, the right-hand crank down. And it's actually very helpful to push weight almost through your right hip into the pedal to really ground the bike. Like you're trying to get downward force onto the bike. You're in your drops. I think that posture is very important. So you're getting your weight over the front wheel. So you're getting plenty of weight by the virtue of the hip over the back wheel and your head over the front wheel. So that connection with the two contact points, your tires on the ground is really solid. I think that's a great starting point. Then start thinking about your line. Look ahead. I had one of my first team pursuit coaches said to me on the track, look where you want to go, not where you don't want to go. As soon as you start focusing on that looks slippy over there. That ravine looks very dangerous over there. <laughs> yeah. Guess where you're going? Like you're going off that ravine, like cue Larry Duff going off a bridge in Father <laughs> Ted. Break before the turns. Like you don't want to be breaking in the turn. When you break, it kind of straightens your bike out. Less so with disc brakes than it did with rim brakes, but it still straightens your bike out. So you want to come into the corner with all your braking done, carry that speed through the corner because what matters actually is your exit speed, not your entry speed. You don't want to come in at 80k an hour and go out at 60k an hour. You want to come in at 60 and go out at 80. So that's definitely another one. I think 
it's too many people steer in the corner when it's actually more about leaning with your body, using your body as like uh, kind of something to steer. Like you're leaning more than you are steering. Steering is, seems like it's kind of hard to explain this, but steering is quite deliberate. Like you're actually moving the handlebars to change direction. On a descent, you're more leaning and you're trying to look ahead to visualize the line. So you want to apex. Brilliant thing to watch is like motorbike racing, mm-hmm. supercross or Formula One. They hit the apex. They're coming through corners, narrow, exit and wide. And it's there's something really beautiful about the flowy nature of it. So when you see someone fast going down a hill like Vincenzo Nibali back in the day or now you watch Mohoric or someone who's a master at it, they just flow from apex to apex. Very little steering, very little braking. And it's actually like a thing of beauty. It is. It's beautiful. It's like coming, a ballet. Coming out of the corners as well. A lot of the corners, you're going to have to pedal and accelerate out of the corner. So you want to think about the gear you want to be in coming out of the corner and have that gear changed mid-corner. Also, don't wear a really flappy kit because that's going to, you know, potential to catch wind, potential. It's just slowing you down. You, you don't want that. It's, it's a false, you know, it's not a true representation of the speed you're going down the hill then you change kit and it starts throwing you off so don't wear flappy raincoats and stuff like that and then I think like anything else you, you just gotta how do you get the Carnegie Hall yeah. practice, practice 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 you have a lovely turn of phrase I'm sure you didn't coin it but I have heard you say it a few times certainly to me is slow smooth as fast and oh we used to always say this this is like <laughs> so me and Peter Ryan we're doing the pursuit stuff we'd always we kind of jumped Peter was on. just for the listeners Peter was on the back of the tandem, tandem. Yeah. he was uh, one of the Paralympic athletes visually impaired visually impaired Anthony was steering the ship so uh, we all we just got obsessed with as I still am with sniper movies so we used to just watch sniper movies and stuff in the evening so we tried to figure out how many sniper analogies we could bring into the pursuit so we'd always say like well slow is smooth and smooth is fast and it actually is it's true. It's so true. You and I watched some guy, we were, you you stayed with me one day, we were doing a really beautiful descent in Mallorca and there was a, <clears throat> a triathlete in front of us and his descending was just like super clunky. He was trying way too hard. He was breaking at all of the wrong you know, all of the wrong points. He was reading the the apex of the bends completely wrong. Now he was going down pretty fast. He's gone down a lot faster than I was, but it just looked awkward. Yeah, some people look like you're going fast. He just needed to like even take it back a couple of kilometers an hour and focus on, as you said, the lean and kind of taking it handy. And yeah, but that was really that when that kind of clicked that's when that kind of clicked with me that smooth, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Remember I had Bottas on the podcast and I was I don't know if I said this to him, but I was definitely thinking about it not comparing the two at all the speeds like they're going over 200k an hour but when you're on a descent it's everything's coming so fast and it's chaos it's like it it has the potential to go really bad really fast there's really bad consequences that can happen to it but I always try and slow it down in my head and in my head I play the same song all the time whether I'm in a race or I'm out at a training camp I have that Beethoven that fifth symphony it's just this really <laughs> like you know da 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 <laughs> always plays in my head in this chaos because it's just like such a calming voice. Yeah, it's like a, a beautiful waltz. Yeah, people can steal that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna steal that. Yours is more like Tropic Thunder or so, <laughs> or ACDC. ACDC, yeah. The very best look, Matt, on your trip out to Girona, I think. Don't do anything outside your comfort zone. This is a slow, this is not something that you learn overnight. It takes a lot, a lot of practice. Okay, next question. I've heard a, a I've heard you talk about the wind conditions you wouldn't ride your bike in, Anthony. But what about cold? I watch it as Skelmos was literally carried off the bike during Flesh Wallone. It's like a corpse. Yeah. Well, a shaking corpse. Like it was terrifying to see. And it made me think about a few dangerous positions I put myself in in the winter. What are the temperatures and conditions you would never risk going out on? That's the thing. That was... I I have to admit I fell asleep on the couch. Uh, I didn't watch that. I just watched the highlights and I saw Scalmos being taken off the bike, and I was like, "Oh my god!" I've I there's been situations where I've been close to that. I mean, not absolutely hypothermic, but kind of getting into like an amber zone, heading towards like an amber warning, <laughs> an amber warning, heading into like a red zone. So yeah. So what would you advise, Anthony? 
I don't like riding, so I spent a lot of time riding in Toronto. Spent winters at a great lad. It was almost like a mentor. He's a teammate for me out there at Jeff Fuel. Pete Morse works in Mariposa bikes now. Mike Barridge, the a proper road man. Before road man was a thing, he was a road man. <laughs> You're and original. He, he schooled me on riding in the winter, and he gave me these brilliant tips and techniques from you know using big flaps on mud guards he'd make them out of coke cans to changing your base layer to you know the length of the height of your cuffs and your gloves but that's not the question asked but because of all his experience he passed on I was able to ride in minus 15 minus 20 minus 25 because that's not what gets you dry cold does not get you what mm. gets you is two degrees three degrees four degrees and rain yeah. or sleet or snow when you get wet and you get cold, that's the killer zone. Like you've had, you've gone out on Saturday morning spins and I'm like, I'm not going. You're like, yeah. why aren't you going? I'm like, because it's four degrees and raining. Like I've been in enough sticky positions. You're not going to die on that, but you're going to be in a really bad world of pain yeah. in that sort of weather. Yeah, that, that, that took a while for the penny to drop for me as well. Just with regards to, I'd be getting up for Saturday on the group ride full of beans, look out the window, be like, ah, do you know if what is it, real number, or whatever, of the Vel- Velomati. <laughs> if you're out riding in the rain, you're a badass, something like that. And I'm just like, yeah, Joe, fuck it, I'm going out, I'm going to get this if ride. You're in a hospital done. with a space blanket <laughs> you're wrapped around you, you're not a badass. <laughs> <laughs> you're an idiot. But um, yeah, I. I, and you'd be like, oh no, I'm not getting out of bed. I'm I'm going to wait till later. I'm going to jump on the wap bike. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going out. That there's no point. And there ensued a very long and miserable day, you know, that I would have to endure. It's awful. So what did you say there temperature wise? I think low single digits. Low single digits. Celsius. Plus, plus rain. And plus rain for me. Yeah. It's horrible. I raced Avoid. the coldest day of my life and it's been my benchmark against which I benchmark everything else since that day since. Anyone, Ed Veal listens to the podcast occasionally. We've had him as a guest. Brilliant lad. He raced that day as well. Anyone who raced that day will never forget it. Lake of Bays, north of Toronto. Uh, it must have been like minus two, minus three, snow, sleet for the entire day. There was about, I don't know, it was about eight finishers from the entire field. I think our old fort. It's a tough day. Right. Bottles were frozen solid. Like the li- the bottle wasn't just frozen into the cage. It was frozen into the cage, but the liquid was frozen inside the bottle. So it was definitely sub zero. Hands were frozen. Cables were frozen. Brakes were frozen. The, the wheels weren't far off. <laughs> <laughs> it was shocking. But so many people that day ended up in space blankets, drinking brandy. There's also, I know we're going to get on to the next question, but there's also this idea of you're a hard man if you ride in that weather. It's actually just not true. Skelmosa is as hard as they come. Oh, no yeah. one gets to that level in pro cycling. Winning yeah. some of the races, Skelmosa is one and isn't rock hard. He's as tough Harder as than you could ever imagine. He's a Harder killer. Harder you could ever be. So if you're, When you're sitting in your office listening to this, you're thinking you're a tough guy. You're not. Not lads, a comparison to this, fella. Like what they've had to go through to get there, the filtering yeah. process. These are the hardest athletes in the world. Yeah. For him to get carried off like that, it's physiological. Some of our bodies just can't take that cold. I've been quite well able to adapt to cold doesn't mean I'm harder than someone else I'm experiencing the same discomfort maybe someone else experiences at 7 degrees in rain I'm not experiencing until 2 degrees at rain these lads are badass Scamos said that he didn't even realise he was hypothermic when he was on the bike so he basically said yeah didn't realise then he started shaking and he thought that he could recover but when he stopped on the mirror for the second time he just couldn't control himself like it looked like he had he'd com- lost absolute like control fit. of his limbs yeah yeah. So there we go. He said that that was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever done. He's kind of underplaying that a little bit, but yeah, he is a tough guy. Hey, Rob, man, excuse the short interruption. I love riding the bike, but on account of being so busy with the podcast at the moment, I'm now what's called a time crunched rider. I never thought I'd see the day, but I have a tool. I'm using what bike to keep myself sharp and on point with specific sessions to maximize that available training time. I have a Watt Bike Adam right here in the recording studio beside me. And when I have an error in between interviews, I jump on. It's removing all the friction points for me. There's no more 10 minute setup, unfolding legs, banging my knees off stuff, getting my hands dirty, usual connection issues. It just works every single time. The Adam's perfect for virtual racing as well because it has crisp gear changes, it has 1% accuracy, and it has max gradient capability of up to 25%. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I honestly couldn't recommend this any higher. I've been using a Watt bike since 2013. 
Honestly, it's the last indoor trainer that you're ever going to need. If you head on over to whatbike.com now and use code ROADMAN10, that's R-O-A-D-M-E-N-T-E-N, and that's going to get you 10% off your Whatbike. Okay, next question. Hey, Sarah and Anthony, what do you think of wearing a helmet with a built-in visor on a normal ride, i.e. not doing a time trial? I've been getting a lot of stick from some of the lads on the group ride, but it's really comfy, really aero, and I like it. Uh, <laughs> that feels like this. Is it hot or not? If, I mean, th- there is somebody that I see on our local bike track every week, and he's been rocking like a an old school aero triathlete pointed no, pointed no, 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 no. back and he wears it like 12 months every year and he's got the massive big like you know the the visor that looks like a like he's a fly, he's a bug of some description and I always just look at him like there's no way that could even be comfortable like it just doesn't make sense to me or safe or exactly or safe so the thing is though that the companies like Park they've just released a kind of like a hybrid from their, you know, the aero helmet that we see the World Tour rider. We saw a good few, good few of the teams wearing the, I think it's EF in the Tour Down Under. They had the POC aero helmet with the big visor. POC have actually come out with kind of like a hybrid for the road, but it still has the big visor. I've actually got a picture of it here and I'll get Wes to, to put it in on the edit for anyone who's looking um, here on YouTube. But it looks kind of cool. Am I... Am I weird for saying that? Look, I think it looks terrible. You think it looks I think terrible? They all look like any visors are terrible. There's nothing cool about them. Now, aero socks aren't cool. And I said they would never catch on, but there's enough of an aero gain. Yeah. You know, people are maybe going to do it. It's a bit tragic. We're, I think we're going to... Uh, can you wear time trial helmets in a normal... No. UCI race you can't but because these are kind of like a hybrid I'm wondering are we going to start seeing these in road races oh no you can wear these in road races you yeah. can yeah, these are road race helmets pa- Pac basically claims that at speeds between 30 and 60 kilometers per hour which is like quite quite yeah. a range only 100% difference there <laughs> the ProSan Air is 18 watts more aerodynamic than its ventral all around your model so they're comparing like a very a pretty low end hel- road helmet to a quite a no the ventrals end. are top of the line road oh they're helmet. top of the line so they're comparing a high end with this new hybrid version of a helmet and there's 18 watts in it. It's kind of interesting. I think people, I think, hot take, I think people, look, the sunglasses are gone so absolutely colossal anyway at the minute. All of your face is basically obscured by the the size of sunglasses these days. Hot take, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of these. As soon as the influencers get their hands on these and then people are like, oh, they've got watts, they've got an excuse to buy a new piece of kit. I think we're going to see them. I prefer to be dropped. (laughs) You'll never catch me in one. Rob Men, I know how serious you take your goal setting, whether they're fitness or life-related goals. If you're looking for a powerful ally to support you on this journey, look no further than Huel. Huel has become my secret weapon for when I don't have time to prepare a balanced meal. It ensures I get the nutrition I need without sacrificing time or taste. Plus, it stops me from reaching for that takeaway menu. I always throw a bottle into my backpack when I'm heading into the city to work and it stops me eating junk convenience foods, snacking on croissants and bars of chocolate because I know they don't support my training goals. It's a handy nutritious meal on the go and it's got over 22 grams of protein. Huel is perfect for athletes that don't have time to cook or prepare food before a training session. It's convenient, nutritious fuel at your fingertips, ensuring you hit your daily fueling needs for that session. Huel Ready to Drink has 26 essential vitamins and minerals in every single bottle. You're getting a whopping 175 health benefits. Plus, it's made from natural ingredients like tapika, sunflower seed, coconut, and more. The best part? It's the flavors. There's eight crazy, beautiful flavors. Iced coffee is what's in my backpack right at the moment. You can get Huel directly to your home. All you got to do is head on over to the Huel website, huel.com forward slash roadman. Okay, next question. Anthony, what do you think of Strava segments? I had a guy last week from my club who I don't really know that well take one of my Strava segments. He took a screenshot and put it in the WhatsApp group and captioned it, in your face, loser. And that's from Mario. <laughs> Do you know what Mario needs? He needs that pock helmet to save him 18 watts and go get his Strava crown back. Oh, this made me laugh because 
I get like an email every single week saying, oh, your laurel wreath has been taken by X or your, you know, I would might have like a KOM or QOM or something and somebody Left takes the it. on in the car. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no idea how I got those. I'd say I was definitely sitting on your wheel for anything I have, any kind of segments I have, I'm definitely well, sitting on your wheel. you started getting loads since you switched from, you had your profile as a male profile. That's true, And then yeah. you switched to it to um, female and then I'm seeing like, what's there is Q- QOM on this, yeah, on this, on that's this. that's right. I had my settings wrong. What do you think of this though? The guy putting it into the into the group saying, in your face, loser. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I, like, it's obviously friendly banter. Like, boy, your man hasn't... I don't think Mario to, is picking it up. No, Mario's as... not picking it up. Well, what they put <laughs> down there. Uh, yeah, go try and hard and get it back. Uh, I have never gone for a Strava segment in my life, I don't think. Yeah, uh, but you have got quite a few of them. Yeah, accidentally. Uh, maybe just doing, a, doing an effort or something. I happened to line up with a Strava segment. It's a little bit bizarre for grown men and women to be sprinted for imaginary finish lines against virtual opponents but maybe I'm old school I don't know there's a a segment that is on our uh, Saturday group oh I do want that yeah I'm not involved in this this is for this is for the big boys and um, you have been holding you have been holding this or somebody else in the group ride that you would be riding with yeah Yeah, have had it for a year and we now have there's a new sheriff in town called Johannes Johannes, hello. And he basically took the Strava segment one Saturday when we were all out and he took it by like 90 seconds. Something. Robbie clean off his wheel. <laughs> I'll get it back. You'll get, it, get back. it back. That's so, coming. On one hand, you're saying there's an imaginary finish line. You know, How much we, you said I have <laughs> <laughs> I need it. I need what? And then you can text him saying, in your face, yeah. loser. <laughs> Okay, next question. Anthony, I notice you don't have a tire sponsor for the podcast. So as an unbiased party, can you tell me what the best tire is for my road bike and what is the best tire for my gravel bike? The gravel around here is mostly fire roads and prairies, nothing too sharp or rocky. I have read a lot of articles in the publications, but hmm, I don't know. The skeptic in me just thinks the manufacturers are throwing the journalists a few quid for a good review. I don't think that that's happening, but... Yeah, no, I don't think it's happening either. Yeah. Uh, one good resource which will answer all his questions, bicyclerollingresistance.com. That'll answer all your questions. You can do your kind of research on what's a fast tire, what's a puncture-proof tire. They put it through really rigorous, rigorous. tests on all the yeah. tires. They're not affiliated with anyone. Off the back of that, I've settled on a couple of tire choices for the road. I don't see a better tire out there than Continental GP5000 S 28 mil tubeless for me run them at 65 psi for my weight they're bomb proof unbelievable combination of rolling resistance and puncture proof and then i'm addicted to the 47 mil specialized pathfinder mm-hmm. tires again great combination of rolling resistance and puncture proof puncture proof means so much on gravel rides because it yep. breaks your heart and you're stranded like i done a long day an eight hour day on the gravel two weeks ago and like on the first climb, the descent off it, there was three or four lads stopped with, like, I don't know how many of them punctured because I came past them fast, but they were like, they had tubes and they were trying to patch tubes or put new tubes in. Like you can't be running clinchers on it. So good tires, good sealants and a good insert. And that'll get you out of a lot of holes. But We've had Dylan Johnson on the podcast and he is kind of a gravel privateer. He does a lot of, he doesn't, I think he kind of prides himself insofar as he doesn't have a tire sponsor. And I don't know if that has changed, but Not sure. he does a lot of rigorous testing on, and he had, he has, I think the Pathfinder were his like particular kind of love and go to. I think he's moved to a new tour. He's moved to a new one. Yeah, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like, so maybe go and check out kind of what he's I saying that's because well. he moved bikes. Uh, he moved to felt. Oh uh, uh, yeah, because he was with Factor. across the felt. Yeah. And felt have more clearance for a 50 mil. So I think he's gone to maybe a 48 so or So Pathfinder didn't have a, a 50 because he likes a really big tire. No, I'm, I have the Factor Austro and you can't get any more than a 47 mil tire on that frame. There's not clearance for it. So maybe, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do your own research. Yes. Okay. Next question. Hey, Anthony, I've heard you are doing the track at 360. Unfortunately. (laughs) I'm doing it too. And I'm kind of getting a bit freaked out now and potentially going to drop down to the 200. I might see you there. (laughs) (laughs) I've been training hard and doing some 10 or 11 hour rides, but can anything really prepare you for 360 kilometers of gravel? What are your fueling and pacing strategies for the day? 
you know what I would say before um, he even goes, you go into the fueling and pacing. It's like decide before the day if you're definitely going to do the 360 or the 200. It's kind of like the night of your final exams, isn't it? And you're like, oh, will I take the honours paper? Will I take the pass paper? And you kind of check it out the last minute and say, oh, feck it, I'm going to do the pass paper, even though you are actually prepared for the 360. Or was, if you were going into your pass and you're like, well, I drop down to foundation at <laughs> the last level. Uh, potentially does happen as well but yeah I would say w- would you say that as well like commit to your distance like now yeah ideally you, but I haven't committed I'm kind of like okay, oh, so I've signed up not- for the 360 but then one of my friends dropped down to the 200 I'm like well, I, just I know I'm going to finish either I'm, I'm not going yeah. to race either I'm hard I'm just going for the fun the experience hang out with the lads uh, 360 a lot of hardship there 200 also a lot of hardship. We're, we're not long yes. back from a Santa Val gravel race, three-day gravel race, around the same schemes in Girona. And I'll tell you what, that gravel is, I'm, I haven't seen what route uh, track a 360 is going to be taking, but I can't imagine there'll be a completely new area. I would say that there'd be a lot of crossover that was happening with the Santa Val race. And it's tough. It's going to be a tough Tough, tough. Well, don't psych like him out. Like, okay, no, fueling and but- pacing. So that was his question, not to get psyched out by Sarah <laughs> for how tough Santa Val was. Uh, nothing too complex, really. Like fueling, I'm going to try and eat like, you know, any of the recommendations, they're pretty standard now. Everyone's like 80 to 120 grams of carbs an hour. Don't do anything new on race day that you mm. wouldn't do in training. It doesn't always have to be, we've been kind of, uh, fed that it has to be gels and it has to be bars like you can also have a handful of Haribo big handful of Haribo is going to give you around 70 grams of carbs which is a lot of carbs but you know jump in and get your race specific stuff that you like I'm using Velo Forte absolutely love that yep. uh, pacing you just don't want to start too hard yeah. everyone starts too hard and I know it's cliche but you can't start too hard on that you need to know what you're zone two upper zone two power is and just be stuck on that for the day it's, you're going to be on your own anyway so there's no point in holding on to groups so you'll dig hard on the first climb to hold on to a group to get a draft for what like then someone stops for a pee stop you don't stop and you're on your own anyway so yeah I think we're a fuel pack like a, a hydration pack I think yeah. that's going to be key to keep hydrated in it because there's not that many refuel stops. Yeah, and that's what I was about to come on to. I was saying that it was really, really tough. And that's why I think that you need to go look at the route and know exactly when your food stations and aid stations are coming up because they're really important for getting water, maybe grabbing some Coke or, you know, putting Coke in your bed on, getting some gels that they're giving out on the day. The one that I think as well, and look, maybe this is a much more experienced bike handler than me, because I found the route quite tough and technical, particularly on the climbs, on the third day, I couldn't fuel or do any hydration for the first kind of 40 kilometres because it was so technical, I couldn't take my hands off the handlebar to eat. And then I completely came apart. So I think have a plan in your hand, in your head, that if you're not a good bike handler, if you don't feel like you can eat and drink on these kind of pretty hard ascents that are, you know, rocky, Pull, oh, do yourself a favour and make hydration and nutrition a priority because that's what's going to stop you from pulling out halfway through. That's good advice. Yeah. Folks, thank you for tuning in to another edition of Rider Support. Thank you for all your questions. You can keep feeding those questions across to Sarah or myself on X and we'll get them answered week after week. There's another video up here, which I know you're really going to love. And down here is going to get you a subscription to the channel. Thanks for tuning in.